Welcome to Wednesday Night Online Bible Study for March 4th, or it's actually March 3rd, sorry, March 3rd, 2021. Uh, tonight we'll be looking at um, Eyewitness Bible Study, uh, their fourth video in the series. It's entitled God Wins, where they try to survey chapters 12 through 20 of the book of Revelation. Uh, obviously, they're taking on way too big of a task, but as a result, we want to try to work with that. I'm just going to kind of read their script that they've given and then I'll do a little talking to try to set things up with any other little questions. Revelation 12 is the continuation of Revelation 5 through 11. By the end of Revelation 11, the Lamb has opened the seven seals of the scroll. The seven angels have blown their trumpets and the two witnesses have appeared. Revelation 11 ends with the opening of God's temple in heaven. Revelation 12 tells of the great sign in heaven with the woman and a dragon. A war breaks out between the dragon and its angel versus Michael and his angels. Though Michael is the victor, the dragon continues to torment mankind. Revelation 13 talks about the two beasts. Revelation 14 and 15, calamities, and it, it continues on. And then in their summary, they say, there are innumerable interpretations of Revelation, which is part of the problem. This message is probably indisputable. Jesus wants his followers to be faithful to him no matter what and no matter how long it takes. No matter if there's persecution by ancient Romans or persecution by ancient Jews or by some future government entity. No matter if there are natural disasters or if there is climate change. The message is to have faith in God. Um, when we get to the video, um, they are just going to throw you in uh, quickly. The um, Angel's going to speak, and I just want to, at least at this point, I want to read um, the key text that he'll be starting everything on, is Revelation chapter 12, verses 7 through 9, and I'll be reading from New American Standard. It reads, And there was a war in heaven, Michael and his angels waging war with the dragon, and the dragon and his angels waged war. And they were not strong enough, and there was no longer a place found for them in heaven. And the great dragon was thrown down, the serpent of old who is called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. Okay, a couple things. If you've been listening to me preach lately, I had a hard time saying it that way traditionally. I wanted to say Satan, but I'm not going to get into that in this, in this issue. Notice there were two different names given for... Satan there. I um, already warned you that they're just going to throw you in. So be ready. Um, beast, once again, when John interprets for you, or the interpretation is a standard interpretation that we can find in hundreds of examples of popular literature, don't ignore that when you read it. Beast is almost, is, is always reference to a powerful nation Usually either they are powerful based on their violent military force or they are powerful based on their wealth. Those are the two images. That's why John and a lot of apocalyptic literature circles back to Babylon as the horrible, horrible example of horribleness back in the olden days because they had both. Um, please bear in mind in this text, no matter what your view of what happens in the book of Revelations, whether it's a historical event or whatever you think is going on here, that saints are being persecuted. Um, it's an important issue. Now, remember how you resolve those things, but just so you get that. In chapter 13, I'm sure we'll spend much time on this, is the famous 666 passage. couple things. Um, it's not complicated to figure out what the original reference to 666 applied to. If you'd like to apply it to something in the future, that's fine. I do want to also point out, for those of you who just need to know this since it's a Bible study, if I grab my Greek New Testament, which is away from me in my office right now, my Greek New Testament, it will tell me that, you know, when, when it says that ominous words and the number of man is 666, there are plenty of valid reasons based on Greek variants, and you can message me later on what a Greek variant is, um, that the number is 616. So before you start building too much into 666, just understand the number could also be 616. Yeah. 
Um, what little notes I've written for myself, I have some reference to the word Satan. In the book of Revelation, it's one of the most common places we see the word Satan, um, but we see it in the first couple chapters. Um, I'm sure in upcoming sessions we will look at the fact, and you can remind me if we haven't, we will look at the fact that the word they translate as Satan here, or Satan here, is a different word than Peter call, than Jesus calling Peter Satan, or many of the references of the Old Testament. Please bear in mind as this angel describes this. I know we're trying to oversimplify this for a media audience and you lose things whenever you create dramatic videos, but I think it's a good job of presenting it and giving us an idea of what's going on and how it would have been heard by the people it was originally written to. Jewish apocalyptic all Jewish apocalyptic literature assumed a very, very, very violent end in which the Jewish people and people who were like them were going to win. And everybody else was going to be squished. You should know this. How many times have you studied the New Testament gospel narrative and somebody like me has to say, well, you know, Peter would have been taught from birth that the Messiah was going to come and destroy things. You have heard this over and over and over again. It's reflected in Jewish apocalyptic literature. John borrows from that technique to use a method that the people would have understood. So all these images of violence and everything would have been assumed by everybody who's reading. Which might change how we look at the last couple chapters, but we'll, we'll get there. Can I emphasize this point enough? It all comes down to the bias we bring to the book of Revelation, the bias we bring to apocalyptic literature. Is this description that the angel is going to give us, is that something that's happening in the future? Which is going to be kind of a stretch because there was a whole discussion of the war in heaven. And you have been taught based on tradition there was a war in heaven and a third of the angels fell down and you probably used Isaiah 14 and in the not great translation which a phrase was changed to Lucifer and it never should have been. And you have the idea that a long time ago a third of the angels fell to the earth and all these things happened, which may or may not be true. But if that happened in the past, what is he describing in the rest of this? And if it happened in the past, what does it relate to? Or is John just telling an elaborate story using images that we can find through that anyone would have understood he was writing to, referring to things that have always happened throughout history. Um, for example, if you were going to take that image, you would say the references to an antichrist in, in the book of Revelation, you would say, well, there have always been antichrists with us. If you need help with that, read First John. If you believe that John the Apostle wrote the book of Revelation and John the Apostle wrote First John, which you have good reason to believe that, he says there are many antichrists in First John. Using apocalyptic image, he kind of talks about one maybe, and talks about they're always with us. And he does seem to intermix the word that I have been te talking to you about Satan, people getting in the way, and Antichrist. Maybe those are the same thing. Maybe. But you got to understand, as you read this, the people who were hearing this elaborate story would listen and they would go, okay, I got it. I got to do this. I got to hold on because it's worth it. Not because something's going to happen for people 2,000, 3,000, 8,000 years from now and we're going to see the end of the world in some literal millennial reign in seven years. That may or may not be true. The main point was you need to hold on no matter how hard it gets because it's worth it and you're going to regret it if you don't.
That's John's point. Never miss that when you're reading apocalyptic literature, especially the book of Revelation. I'm going to be quiet now because I've rambled more than I intended to. I'm going to turn it over to Eyewitness Bible Study, and they are going to dramatically present this to you, and I'm going to come back and just finish up a few things. Few angels are mentioned by name in the Bible. I'm one, Michael. Jude describes me as an archangel. I am also mentioned in the books of Daniel and Revelation. Can't help but notice all the angels in the book of Revelation. The last named angel in the Bible is Abaddon, also known as Apollyon, the angel of the abyss that John names in Revelation. He was king of the locust-like creatures that tortured people when the fifth angel sounded a trumpet. I get noticed shortly after the seventh angel blew the seventh trumpet. After that trumpet sound, God's temple in heaven was opened. Then the scene shifted, and John got to see amazing things. The Apostle John's descriptions of the events leading to the coming of the Lord have frightened, thrilled, and encouraged Christians throughout the centuries to be faithful followers of Jesus. The message of the entire book, God overcomes Satan and is reunited with his people. A wondrous sign appeared in heaven, a pregnant woman clothed with the sun, the moon under her feet, and a crown of twelve stars on her head. Another sign appeared in heaven, a giant red dragon with seven heads and crowns and ten horns. The dragon's tail swept a third of the stars from the sky and flung them to earth. The dragon stood in front of the woman to devour her child when it was born. The male child was snatched up to God, and the woman fled to the desert for 1,260 days where God took care of her. My turn. There was war in heaven, and my angels and I fought against the dragon and his angels. We defeated the dragon and his angels and hurled them to the earth. The dragon was Satan, the arch enemy of mankind from day one. We defeated him. That epic battle gets only three verses in your Bible. Now, I'm not complaining that it only gets three, although I do think John could have been more expansive. What I want to point out is why these verses illustrate why Revelation is so fascinating and frustrating, and why there are so many interpretations of it. Ask yourself these kinds of questions. Was this war literal or symbolic? literal, did it happen in the distant past or in the future? If symbolic, what does it symbolize? How does this account fit into the overall story of Revelation? Does this mean that Satan is on earth now because I put him there? Why didn't I just kill Satan instead of hurl him to earth? If you delve into Revelation, you find out that you never get to the end of these types of questions way more questions than answers. Fortunately, as John said at the beginning, you get blessed by reading, hearing, and taking to heart the words of Revelation. You don't have to understand it to get a blessing. Anyway, after Hurl to Earth, Satan was filled with fury and pursued the woman, but God protected the woman. So Satan went to make war against the rest of the offspring of the woman. Those offspring were those who obey God's commandments and follow Jesus. It's not often that John explains the things he is seeing in heaven. But at this point, you know that Satan is the dragon, and he is in a war to destroy the people of God. You know that I, Michael, defeated Satan and sent him to earth from heaven. The next thing John saw was a fearsome beast arising from the sea. It had ten horns, seven heads, ten crowns on his horns, and a blasphemous name on each head. Satan gave the beast all of his power and great authority, so that the whole world was astonished enough to follow and worship Satan and the beast. Well, 
not the whole world. The saints of God, whose names were written in the book of life, didn't, and they endured great persecution because of it. Another beast arose from the earth and was given great power to enact on behalf of the first beast. He set up an image of the first beast and forced everyone to worship it. He had such power that no one could buy or sell anything unless they had the mark of the beast on their right hand or forehead. The mark or name or number of the beast was 666. This number has permeated your culture in such an interesting way, often associated with strange and mystical power. References abound. In rock bands alone, it's code almost. Anytime anyone wants to infer apocalyptic or satanic mayhem, it's 666. John saw another amazing sight. Jesus was standing on Mount Zion with his 144,000 servants singing praise to him. Three angels were flying in midair. The first proclaimed the eternal gospel to everyone on earth. The second proclaimed that Babylon had fallen. The third gave a terrible warning about worshiping the beast or receiving its mark. Afterward, other angels came to gather the harvest of the earth, which seems to have resulted in great devastation. John must have felt relieved with what happened next. He saw a sign in heaven of seven angels with the seven last plagues. When these plagues ended, God's wrath would be complete. The seven plagues were contained in seven bowls. As the bowls were poured out, abscesses broke out all over the bodies of those who had the marking of the beast. Then, poisoned water, scorching heat from the sun, debilitating darkness, drought, earthquakes beyond the Richter scale, and hail, boulder-sized hail, weighing hundreds of pounds, pummeling the earth and its people. Catastrophes the likes of which the planet has never seen. Maybe now they will soften their hearts. Maybe now they would understand the order of things. Mankind cursed God. Instead of repenting, mankind cursed God. John was carried away to see a woman sitting on a beast. She was wealthy, filthy, rich. An angel tried to explain to John about the beast and woman, but I'm pretty sure John was just as mystified after the explanation as before. What John was clear about was this. Jesus would make war against all evil and overcome it. According to the angel, the woman was a city, ruling over the earth with every manner of evil. Then another angel came and proclaimed the destruction of that city and all of those with a relationship with the city. Let's pause and summarize. A lot has happened. My angels and I defeated Satan and his angels and threw them to earth. Through the beast, the fallen angel, Satan ruled over the earth and caused evil of every sort. The faithful people of God suffered immense persecution but persevered. The world became evil and was dominated by the enemy of God, Satan. God continued to discipline people, hoping they would repent and turn to him, but few did. Eventually, God reached the end of his patience. What happened when God ended his patience? All inhabitants in heaven began praising and worshiping God because it was the start of the end. The adversary's reign was over. Satan's rule on earth was at an end. John saw heaven standing open. Instead of quaking in fear, John started celebrating. There was a gigantic white horse ridden by Jesus himself, followed by the armies of heaven on white horses. John's words were entirely inadequate to describe the awesome sight before him. The results of the battle were so sure that another angel invited all the birds of the air to come and eat the flesh of all the evil people of the world that would soon be defeated. The beast gathered all the kings and people of the earth to fight against Jesus and his troops. It was a short battle.
the beast and false prophet were captured and thrown into the lake of burning sulfur and all of their troops were killed. The birds gorged themselves with their flesh. As John joyfully watched his Lord conquer the earth, an angel came and seized the defeated enemy of God, the arch enemy of mankind, the serpent, Satan, and bound him in the abyss for 1,000 years where he was unable to wrought any evil on earth. The faithful followers of Jesus came to life and reigned with him for a thousand years. Satan was released at the end of that time and had a last gasp war and was defeated again. This time, he was thrown into the fiery lake of burning sulfur with the beast and false prophet for all eternity. After countless eons, God's patience came to an end. The status of all eternity was about to be fixed. John saw a great white throne with God sitting on it. The dead were judged according to what they had done. Each person was judged. Then death and Hades were also thrown into the lake of fire. If anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. For those whose names were written in the book of life, they got to be a part of the new heaven and earth. But I will leave it to Peter to tell you of that. Many lessons to learn from Revelation. But I want to leave you with something that often gets lost in the telling. Yes, there are epic battles and evil is formidable. And there's a lot of scary stuff mentioned in John's writing. And some of it is indecipherable. But I'm an angel. Archangel. And though I don't know everything, I do know this about all that. God wins. You definitely want to be on his side before all this starts. Okay, I'm back. Though I may have my struggles as someone with a church history degree and theological background with the oversimplification of eight chapters of the book of Revelation, here's what we can know for sure. If you want to understand what it would have sounded like when somebody read these words, and let's assume the most reliable historical evidence that we have that John, the Apostle, the writer of the Gospel, the writer of 1 John, was right, wrote the book of Revelation and was in exile. And let's assume he was in exile in, on Patmos. That the letters reach the seven churches of Asia Minor, which is not unrealistic to conceive of. Someone would have had to read them. I know we forget this because we live in a period of time in which education is more valued and we have time for people to get an education. But probably, and I'm doing this from memory, so if someone comes back later and says that's not correct, I have no problem with that. Of the people who were in Asia Minor in the Christian churches, I'm fairly confident that less than 10% of them could read or could have read something this long. So someone has to stand up and read it to everyone else, visualize a parent reading a bedtime story. Though I don't know the book of Revelation, make a great bedtime story. That's my best analogy. People are having this read to them. They are not holding it and analyzing it in the first century. They are hearing the narrative. They have heard the narrative of the dragon and the woman, and they know exactly what that is making reference to, of evil. And Jesus. And them. 
and all the different references on the they would have tracked along with that. And that's we learned about that in Rome and you're trying to warn us not to make the same mistakes that were made in the past because we don't want to have this happen. You live in a time period in which at any moment you can push a button on your remote at home and get some of the latest special effects in any movie you want. For them, this is state-of-the-art entertainment. Now, it wasn't done for entertainment's sake. It was done to teach them to hold on. It is completely reasonable that the people this was written to have literally watched family members die because they were followers of Jesus. They have literally watched businesses fall apart and could not exist because they could not prove that they had offered incense to Caesar. And thus, they were not able to take the anti-mark. We'll, I'm sure, get into that next week. Next week is supposed to be a breakdown of of chapters 12 through 16. So if you have any questions about chapters 12 through 16, feel free to ask them, leave them in the comments. I'll be happy to cover that. We may spend the whole time on just chapter 13 because that's usually where people get bogged down. They have been told this, and then they are reassured that no matter how awful it gets, and no matter how hard you have to hold on, just as followers of God have always held on, it's going to be worth it. It's going to be worth it. Now, we live in a time period where we can have a different perspective about that. But it is reasonable to assume that the people who were written to by the book of Revelation don't even have all of the New Testament at their disposal. It is reasonable to assume they have pieces of it. But they don't have even what we have now. They needed reassurance. And that's what the book of Revelation is intended to do. Whether you, as Fee and Stewart, talk about... Well, I've I think the quote's here somewhere. Let me find it. It's a quote I had to memorize back in seminary, I believe. Something to the effect of, this book was not intended to prophesy countries come into existence. This book was not intended to prophesy all these things. It may, but it's not its primary purpose. But it was intended to encourage people just like it's intended to encourage people who live in countries in which it's against the law currently to be a follower of Jesus. To encourage people who live in Albania, to encourage people who live who who live in Asian countries in which it's you know they're vilified for even mentioning Jesus, that it's worth it. As we study apocalyptic literature, never forget what it was originally written for. And any interpretation you get that ignores what it was originally written for. We need to be careful. Though I have some scholarly problems with the angels' media presentation, his point is valid. These words were written to give hope to real people. Now, if they give you hope because you see in the future some literal events, that's fine. But never, ever, ever forget what they were primarily written for. Because, you've heard me say a thousand times, a biblical book can never mean what a biblical, te biblical book never meant. Next week we'll break down chapters 12 through 16. Obviously, as I've already implied, people like me tend to spend way too much time on chapter 12 and 13, and I want to fit it into this 30-minute window because on Wednesday nights we're doing the Zoom prayer meeting at 7.15. So I want to give you enough time if you watch this live. <coughs> Let me pray for us. Because local Revelation can be overwhelming because we're so far away from what was originally written. And anyone who tells you the book of Revelation is easy, I would try not listening to them anymore. <laughs> Let's pray. Holy God, thank you for just 
this evening. Thank you for this time. Thank you for giving us a space. Thank you for the book of Revelation. And yes, we have to struggle. And yes, we have to think. And yes, we have to do that thing where we transport our minds to go back almost 2,000 years ago to real people who are losing jobs, who are watching people be killed right in front of them. Help us not to lose faith when we just have to make decisions to trust in you. Thank you for the power that the book has and for the power that the book had in the first century and the power it can still have today. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks, everyone. We'll see you next week. Once again, if you have any questions about the things that I have said or was in that video, we're going to spend the next two weeks breaking down one session, chapters 12 through 16, one session, chapter 7 to 20. If we spend too much time on 12 through 16, we'll push things back. But just so you understand, that's the goal. Um, and I will see you next week. Thanks.